this is Yusuf on my channel and as I promised um, I'll make a video on the uh, Keper Nagast. Um, I had read this but I had to reread it uh, um, when I was a catechumen because I was taking um, might have been before I was a catechumen. Um, <coughs> I was taking an African history class. Um, and it was pretty intense. Uh, and I had already known about the, the Kebra Nagast um, because of the things about the Ark. I read um, Graham Hancock's book on uh, Search for the Ark of the Covenant. Um, and Graham Han Graham Hancock is a nut, but um, there are pieces of information that he gives that are really good. Now, to give you an overview of the Kepra Nagast, is that the Queen of Sheba um, comes up, um, she hears of Solomon's wisdom, comes up to meet King Solomon. Um, she's kind of enamored by his wisdom. And I don't know if this is in Kebra Nagast or another Ethiopian story because there's there's a couple of them floating around, so I don't know if this is in the proper Kebra Nagast. Um, she says, he says, uh, she says, she basically says, I'm not going to sleep with you. And he says, all right, well, under one condition, you can't drink any water during the night. If you drink any water, then you have to sleep with me. So he fills her room with uh, very salty and very uh, sweet goodies and stuff like that. You know, things that make you thirsty. Well, she gets thirsty, she takes a drink of water. Uh, so uh, they have intercourse, and <clears throat> she bears a son, Menelik, also known as Menelik I. Uh, and it's said in the Kebra Nagas that he's spotted like a leopard, basically. He is black and white. And even the Ethiopians depict Solomon as white. This is the kind of foolish thing about <laughs> the black Hebrew Israelites because um, even the Ethiopians now um, this story uh, do you want to know if you want to know where it arises from it actually arises from the Solomonoids um, which were Aksumite or Cushite uh, <coughs> and uh, at St. Mary's Church they claim to have the Ark of the Covenant uh, I, I, I kind of don't know where to begin but um you have Philip the Evangelist being one of the people that brings, um, and this is not Philip the Apostle, uh, the Ethiopian, that's an axe that brings uh, Christianity to Ethiopia. Uh, you also have St. Mark, which is also attributed to Ethiopia and all of Africa, to be the Apostle to all of Africa. Um, but there was a large Jewish community down there. And I actually believe, uh, well, okay, let me finish with Menelik first. Menelik uh, wants to go back to Ethiopia. So he goes back and uh, Solomon sends, you know, a big guard with him. I think it's his sons or the strongest of his sons with him. And they actually take the ark with them. Menelik doesn't know about this. Um, and by the time Menelik learns that they're carrying the Ark with them, he he doesn't like this. But they're whisked away to Ethiopia anyways, like magically, almost kind of like magic carpet <laughs> ride type of thing. And the Ark had been in Ethiopia ever since. This is the time of King Solomon. Uh, I personally believe that there's plenty of evidence that under uh, either Hezekiah or Manasseh, uh, most likely Manasseh, that there was so much corruption, evil, and idolatry in 
um, in the temple, and they saw, and the priests saw the destruction coming. I mean, northern Israel was already gone. They knew it was coming, and they weren't going to allow the pagans to grab hold of the ark. So they take off with it, and there's. <coughs> I think they first brought it to Elephantine Island. This is around um, the 500s um, that they take off at the Ark. Um, maybe 600 BC, but it's it's way it's like four or five hundred years after Solomon. At least at least 300 some odd, 400 years after Solomon. Um, and. Uh, I think um, a group of priests actually were basically bringing it as far away as they possibly could because Egypt could be conquered next. So they go down and um, I think they brought it to Elephantine Island. I could do a whole a video on that about how the tabernacle lines up. And then it ended up in a few various different places and now it's in Axum, Ethiopia. So there was Jews living there. Um, and then there was uh, <coughs> um, a sailor from Constantinople uh, that got shipwrecked there and met a king. And uh, they say non-Christian king, but it, it could have been just a form of Christianity. Some, I mean, they were probably waiting for something like this. You know, they you already have. Christianity coming down the Nile probably from the Copts and uh, stuff like this, but uh, and even trade. So <clears throat> the king converts to uh, to Christianity, and this is on the edge. This is like uh, I think it's called Ethiopia. Uh, I can never pronounce it, um, but Ethiopia in the old thing or um, Saba or Sheba. In, in Sheba is both southern um, southern Arabia and Ethiopia. Those were both were the kingdoms of Sheba uh, at one point. Was it at that time? Uh, no, I'm, well, I might have, well, no, not at the time of the Byzantines, but. Uh, <coughs> So a guy gets shipwrecked there. I actually thought there was two of them, but I was talking to someone. He says no, there's there was one. Pretty sure there was two guys though, and their early coins bear shipwrecked of two men. Um, maybe the second one was uh, an image of Christ or, or something like that, or an allusion to an angel. Uh, and uh, the nearest patriarch it is Alexandria. So he goes to the Alexandria. He says these people are converted to Christianity. What what are we going to do? And they received it very easily because probably because they had already heard stories of Christianity and because they have a Jewish base down there, a strong Jewish community down there. Now this is one of the best um, examples for Christians and Jews living alongside each other in peace for thousands of years. Um, so Ethiopia gets set up with Constantinople. Constantinople recognizes them as a kingdom. And one could say that Haile Selassie was the last Roman emperor because he was in, in all the trappings of Byzantium. Now, at the time, the the emperor was a monophysite. Um, and I know people say myophysite or whatever, but the Ethiopians for a long time were very monophysite. But they did have the writings coming down. I believe it was Athanasius, uh, the famous Athanasius, um, that actually said, look, you got shipwrecked there, you're going to be the bishop. And, you know, this, the dude from Constantinople, now bishop of uh, the Ethiopians. Um, <coughs> and I, the Ark was down there at that time. And uh, I still think the Ark is an accent. And there are many things, I think, from the temple that are down in Axum. And there's some very ancient stuff down there. Uh, 
now where the story of the Kabir Nagas comes in about Menelik, the Queen of Sheba, Solomon. Um, this is under the Solomonoids. This is 13th century, so 1200s. Now keep in mind, Constantinople is not a Chalcedonian Sea or a Monophysite Sea. Alexandria is heavier on the Monophysite, but they still had Chalcedonians there. Um, Antioch, um, I think there's sufficient evidence to show that it was a Chalcedonian Sea and even more so because it I mean, that's where Arianism came out of, it's where Nestorianism, they may not have liked it because of its Chalcedon's rebuke of, of Nestorianism, uh, but it was much more natural to that area than uh, Myophysite or Monophysite or, or whatever Alexander was preaching at the time. And I, I had made a video on the difference between theologies between Alexandria and Antioch. Um, now there were two groups, there were Nubians and there were Cushites. This is what I believe they were called, but we remember them as these. Um, the Cushites or the Aksumites were um, what you would picture as an Ethiopian today. The Nubians were more of what we learned in African history as Bantu. They, were, they looked almost black West African. They were Chalcedonian. The Solomonoids wiped them out, and I mean wiped them out in the Old Testament <laughs> uh, version of it. They eradicated them, like the Anglo-Saxons uh, on the uh, on the Britons, or you know the Franks in Gaul, or, or the the Latins going into uh, the Iberian Peninsula. I mean, or recent case, um, the English and the Dutch taking uh, Manhattan from the Manhattan Indians. Uh, they I mean, they was get rid of them all. Um, so, no more Nubians but Cushites. And this was written during the Solomonoids. And they had the Bible. They had many other, a lot of books too that we don't have in, or, or the West doesn't have in its current Bible. And they have different variances on different books. And the Kebra Nagas um, paraphrases a lot of the Old Testament. Not so much in the New Testament, but a lot of the Old Testament. Um, and maybe paraphrase is too weak of a word, I mean almost directly quotes from it. Um, and I believe it's in Amoric. Uh, <coughs> someone tried saying it was in Coptic, and then it's in Arabic. I can't imagine it being in Arabic. Um, and this is from years ago, people talking about this stuff. Originally, it may have been in Coptic, um, but today I'm almost 100% sure it's in Amharic, which is the language that's spoken there. It could still be in Coptic. Who knows? Um, I haven't read it in the original language. Uh, but they want to—they have a strong Jewish presence there, and they want to tie. They want some tie with the Israelite line. So this is story of Menelik and how the Ark got there. Well, the Ark's there, but it didn't get there at that time. It got there, I believe, 400 years later. It's in St. Mary's in Axum, in their capital. Um, <laughs> and uh, Haile Selassie, or Ras Teferi, which is where the Rastafarians get their name, Ras, King. Um, I believe he, he was the 444th or 442nd descendant of Menelik, uh, the offspring of the Queen of Sheba and King Solomon. Now I believe Menelik was mythical, but uh, this is what got established under the Solomonoids. Ethiopia is like the Thailand of Africa or Thailand is the Ethiopia of Asia. It didn't get colonized. I mean, the Italians kind of made a half-ass effort to conquer it, but, I mean, the Ethiopians were a strong national people. I mean, they, they loved their culture. Their tradition was very old. They had their own writing. Um, 
they were following a form of Christianity uh, that was unchanged. Um, and the Eastern Orthodox thought that Prester John was going to come from Ethiopia. It's this idea of a black king coming and fighting off the Muslims because they had been cut off um, from the Muslim armies for so long. Funny thing is, is that the icons of Jesus, of St. Paul and St. Peter look identical to the icons everywhere in the world. It's not a black Jesus with a fro, it's not, I mean, he's, uh, it looks like Jesus. That's why I believe that's what Jesus looked like. Um, and uh, you can make the argument that uh, since Philip the Evangelist and St. Mark that Ethiopia had an older tradition than Rome, but remember it was in contact with Constantinople and then Alexandria. I believe now it's it's autonomous. I don't think it's autocephalous. I don't think they have to report to um, or they're overseen by Alexandria. Uh, <coughs> what else was I going to say It's important? Um, there might be a part two to this because I don't know. You can tell I'm in a garage right now, kind of freezing. It's my, my coat. But um, I actually uh, knew a girl, and you know, I was talking to her about orthodoxy, and she was going to um, a Catholic college over here in Chicago. And I was telling her about Ethiopian orthodoxy, and she goes, "Oh, when did the colonizers get there? When did the Europeans bring um, Christianity to them?" And I kind of recoiled. I said, "No, that's the natural indigenous." I mean, if you want to talk about the most ancient, unchanged religion in Africa, Ethiopian Orthodoxy. Um, long before Islam, and it was made up of Ethiopian. Um, the, uh, <laughs> and I, I was actually kind of horrified by that. Here's this, this black American girl, um, who herself is a Christian, she's going, she wasn't Catholic, but she was interested in things, and, uh, you know, I said, there, there was no colonizers, they accepted Christianity, and they've been Christian, and they were probably Christian before um, the, uh, the shipwreck happened, and uh, before they got in um, communication with Alexandria. Uh, and they're in communion with the Armenians, um, the non-Chalcedonian, um, Syriac, uh, and uh, the uh, Orientalist Coptics of Alexandria. I believe uh, Pope Shenouda had passed away, but they were in communion with him. Uh, <coughs> it's not, again, joining the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. If you join it um, and you want to be a black Nash and say, oh yeah, well this church and all the other churches suck. Uh, not even the Ethiopians believe that. Every Ethiopian Orthodox church has a ark in it. It's a representation of the ark. But I do believe that actually have the true ark. I don't believe the Menelik story in the Kabir Nagas. Um, but I still believe they have the ark. And I think there's proof of that. Or at least... Uh, very heavy evidence towards it. Um, <coughs> but yeah, this story came under this came from the Solomonoids of the 13th century, 1200s, and this is when they wiped out the Nubians. So it was just Kushites, it was Aksumites. Um, and it's too bad because Ethiopia was run pretty much the same way up until I believe the Magistu government in the 80s, the communists overthrew it after Haile Selassie died. Um, but yeah, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, this is one of the arguments that I have against, oh, well, we're, we were never Monophysites, we were Myophysites, because for a long time the Armenians and for a long time the Ethiopians were saying Monophysite, 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 and even in their ideas. 
I mean, even, even when they wrote out what they believed, it was monophysite. Now, for them correcting themselves now, if they want to say myophysite, they're, I mean, good for them. Uh, but they did wipe out the Chalcedonians, who were the Nubians, because back then it was kind of allied by your tribe or your race or whatever. It was, I mean, Ethiopia was a civilized civilization, it was Christian. Um, these are Orthodox priests of the Oriental Communion, uh, and I respect them. Uh, and <laughs> they didn't have the Seventh Ecumenical Council. They weren't influenced by Rome. Or, I mean, Rome got to them eventually. I mean, the Portuguese came in at some point, or some, or maybe even the Italian. I think I think the Catholic Church made contact with them before uh, Mussolini. Um, and the, the Roman Catholics always thought Prester John was coming from India. <laughs> by the way, um, and the Orthodox thought he was coming from Ethiopia. Um, but that's kind of the story of where Prester John comes from. So this is a brief overview of the Kabir Nagas, um, uh, what it contains, and uh, the environment that it grew up in. Peace to you. May God save Serbia and Syria. Uh, please pray for all those who have lost a loved one recently, and uh, pray for those who are, are recovering from surgery need to go into surgery, those who are suffering, those who are near death, um, and all those who are uh, suffering because loved ones are suffering. Um, please pray for the persecuted people of the world, especially of the Middle East. Um, peace to you. May God save Serbia and Syria. And uh, God bless Ethiopia.